uh, that you recite that at the beginning of any activity. Uh, if you recite the Tashi prayer at the beginning of any activity, that it, um, it will help uh, bring auspiciousness to the situation. So uh, we'll start with uh, page 34 and, and read that and uh, all the way to page 36. Here we go. I'm going to use a melody that I'm familiar with. Om Nansi Nanda Ranshin Lun Trupe Trashi Cho Chu Jing Haju Pai Sanje Chu Dangan Dun Pape Hitsok Kula Chat Salda Chat Trashi Shok Drun Mehi Jau Po Sal Ten Dun Trupagan Jampe can pog a drop of tumpa. Good la gompa ja chair drop a chen. Lumpo tarpa sal drop a tani. Sem chen tam che la gondra pe hipa. It sim se pa sal ra drop a te. Sen san tu pe tra she pa pelhua. De washe paje la chat salo, Jambo jenu pal den do jesin, Chen raisi wangum po jampe pal, Sahi nim po drip pa nam pa herself, Nam ke nim po pa chokun tu son, Ut pal do je pe carlushin dan. Nor Buddha Waral Trini Mahi Chak Sen Le Nam Trashi Pelji Cho John Chup Sem Page La Chat Salo Page thirty five Rin Chen Du Cho Trashi Sergi Ya Du Chong Bon Song Yi On Kamala Yen Dratin Dam Bin So Ba Be Yu Minuk Jout Sen Wang Kyur Kor Horte Rin Chen Da Cho Che Ki Chat Sen Chen Cho Du Jawa Chu Ching Ge Ke Ma Geg So Ngo Wo Dren Pe Pa Pe Hoi Tra shi la mo ge la cha tsa lo page 35. San pa chen po de jun se me hi bu. Mi dan den dan ya po yo ko sum. Pa ke po dan lu wang mi mi hi san. Nam tu se te la te kor lo dan. Tari shu la dan dun dun dor je hi chen. Pi wan rel tri chu ten jau ten sin. Sa sum ne su ge le tra shi hi pel. Ji ten kyong ha je la cha tsa lo. Da cha ten dir cha wa tsong pa la. Ge dan ne war se wa kun ji ne. Du dun pa pel sam de yi shen drup. Tra shi de le pun sun so par show. Thanks very much, guys. Um, if you have the red books there in front of you, if you could turn to page uh, 48, we're going to recite the refuge prayer at the very beginning of that page, uh, the top of page 48. And we'll recite it in English, thinking that we dedicate the session that we're doing together today, that we dedicate it to the benefit of all beings. We'll recite that, we'll recite that three times. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Community, until I reach enlightenment, I go for refuge. By practicing the six perfections, generosity, and so forth, in order to benefit beings, may I achieve Buddhahood. In the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Supreme Community, until I reach enlightenment, I go for refuge. By practicing the six perfections, generosity, and so forth, in order to benefit beings, may I achieve Buddhahood. In the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Supreme Community, 
Until I reach enlightenment, I go for refuge. By practicing the six perfections, generosity, and so forth, in order to benefit beings, may I achieve Buddhahood. Thank you, guys. And that'll be the end of using the red books for the time being. You can set them aside. I'll recite a short prayer of my own, and then we'll begin. Oh, Paulin Zawai Lama Rinpoche, Dagi Chiwar Pede De, Shiva Kadre, Jevo Gone, Jason Te, Kuzum Tuking a Drip Saldu So. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I see that uh, I see that we've got uh, we've got seven people uh, on uh, on Zoom today, and we've got two, four, six, seven here. Uh, so we've got uh, fourteen folks. So thanks very much for uh, taking time to be with us today. Um, the reason I wanted to do this class was because last November we were able to uh, consecrate and install that beautiful stone monument out front. And I've been very busy calling it a monument because most, most Western people don't know what a stupa is. And sometimes when they hear the word stupa, they think of the English word stupid and they have a little misunderstanding. So, uh, so I thought it would be nice if we could learn what a stupa is and how to, inter how to interact with it. Now, I have to tell you a tiny bit of history um, I myself have been fascinated with stupas and statues and shrines ever since I got involved in Buddhism. I've been a little bit of what I now call a shrine geek. I am a bit of a shrine geek. Some people are Harry Potter geeks. Some people are Star Trek geeks. I am a shrine geek. And so I confess to you now, I am a geek. And I love everything that has to do with shrines, statuary, and sacred objects. I don't know, I, it's kind of like kids who get fascinated with dinosaurs. I'm just saying it's where I'm at. So uh, if you've had like little brothers and sisters or, or kids or nephews or nieces that get fascinated with anything and stay fascinated with it, well, here we go. So, um, so my, uh, my, uh, my uh, teacher, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche, uh, really believed in the power of these monuments. And so he caused many monuments of like this to be built around the world. And it was, in, the, in a way, it was one of his special activities was to build all of these monuments. And there are literally dozens of monuments uh, that he has caused to be built in various parts of the US. And also um, there are, he's caused to be uh, built, uh, I mean, to be um, created and filled many small stupas of just, a, of just a few inches each. So he's caused tiny, he's filled and consecrated tiny ones, medium-sized ones, big ones. He's, he has done many, many, many of these. And, uh, and so when he passed away in 2019, uh, uh, we, of course, uh, put together a group of people who then built and consecrated a stupa to Kemper Rinpoche at the three-year retreat center at Carme Ling in upstate New York. So the, so the work of Kemper Rinpoche building stupas goes on. And not only that, uh, just recently, uh, Kemper Rinpoche's nephew, Lama Karma Drodol, uh, created or caused to be uh, con con constructed a small stupa. I can't remember whether it's three feet tall or four feet tall that's recently been filled and installed at the Karmatriana Dharma Chakra Monastery, our home monastery in Woodstock, New York, dedicated to Kempo Karthar Rinpoche. So I guess you could say like father, like daughter. <laughs> Kempo Rinpoche is our spiritual dad. And so uh, I consider myself to be one of his kids, spiritual kids. And, uh, and so I find it delightful that I get an opportunity to talk with you about stupas today. Now, what I'm gonna to say today is not by any means encyclopedic. I'm going to give you sort of the reader's digest version uh, of what a stupa is and how to interact with it. But, I, but hopefully by the time I'm finished with this uh, little slideshow that I'm gonna do for you, you will understand how incredibly special this small monument is out front. 
and how wonderful it is that we get the opportunity to practice with it. So uh, thank you very much. Ah, yes, appreciated. Thank you. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, the enlightened being we now know as uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni know that he was born 2,500 years ago in India. He was, uh, he was a prince in a royal family of a small city state in Northern India. And when he, after he had married at a young age, produced an heir to the kingdom at a young age, he left his uh, wife and child in the care of his father, the king and his stepmother, Queen Maya. I'm sorry, Queen, uh, Queen uh-oh. Her name just went out of my head. She was, she later became a Buddhist nun. Uh, Maya Devi was his mother, but his stepmother, it just, um, his wife is Shashudara. Anyway, it's going to have to come back a later time. So leaving his uh, wife and child in the care of his father and stepmother, he then set out on a spiritual quest. And as part of that spiritual quest, he underwent six years of intense asceticism, um, almost starving himself in the process. But he couldn't find among any of the yoga meditations of his day, he couldn't find the answer to the question he was seeking, which was, why is there suffering in the world? And so, uh, and so what he did was he realized that he was being too extreme in his practice of spirituality and he needed to moderate and find a middle path. So he got up from his ascetic practice, went and had a bowl of rice and uh, rice and yogurt and milk. And with that fortification, he sat down again and with his mind in an even spot, he allowed his mind to come to rest and then to uh, meditate upon itself. So meditating upon the nature of his own mind, Prince Siddhartha became the Buddha, Shakyamuni, the awakened one. And after he became the Buddha, after he uh, arose from this enlightenment, he was asked to teach his wisdom. And then he uh, taught his wisdom for the next 45 years all over Northern India. And so, uh, and so what he ended up doing was at the end of his life, he gave one final teaching. And that one final teaching was that he passed away he actually passed away. So you would think, well, an enlightened being, wouldn't he live forever? And the answer is no, because all things are impermanent and the body even of an enlightened being does have an expiration date. And so his final teaching was to pass away. And before he passed away, he was asked by his disciples, how uh, teacher, how should we remember you? How should we learn? How should we uh, honor you? And how should we remember you? And so, uh, and so what he said was, I want you to go to the places that were part of my life. Go to those places. Do pilgrimage to those places. Meet me in those places. Find me in those places. Pray to me in those places. And, and, and you know, supplicate me in those places because I dwell there forever. And so in this way, in this way, he, in, he actually started the first Buddhist pilgrimage by saying, go to these places. And uh, he asked that after his death, that he be cremated and that his ashes be gathered into eight collections. And that these eight collections be enshrined at eight places that were important to his life. And so that is how we arrived at the stupa. The word stupa means mound. It literally means mound. And the very first stupas look like conical, not, not exactly, they're not, they're not conical. They're more, sphere, they're, they're more round shaped uh, mounds. So these, uh, so these original stupas were just mounds. And then gradually architectural features were added to the mounds that had symbolism. There's an ancient symbol called the harmaka, which is, um, which is a square. 
and it's actually placed at the top of the mound. And often the eyes of the Buddha are painted upon it. And this, uh, this structure, which kind of predates Buddhism, you know what I mean? The, this particular structure is one that uh, is on the stupa today. I won't be able to tell you the meaning of all of the parts of the stupa, but I will be able to describe them to you. So they started as mounds and then architectural features, including this ancient harmaka, uh, were added. Then a, uh, I think it's spelled H-A-R-M-I-K-A. -A. Harmaka. It could also be spelled differently, but that's my best remembrance of it. There's a spire added to it and so on. And so these architectural features later developed into mathematical proportions that create an internal feeling of ease, a mental ease in the people looking at it. In other words, sacred harmony. There is a type of, I guess you could, uh, those of you who have heard of feng shui, you know, feng shui, you know, uh, the producing harmony with one's environment, will know that the, um, uh, that when you see something that is pleasing, that is in harmony, you feel better inside. So that's how we arrived at, how people arrived at the, um, at the uh, proportions that are in, used in stupa building today. They, because they're pleasing. So um, that's a little bit about the history. The Buddha's ashes, were um, placed in these eight types of, of reliquaries. The word reliquary is really kind of an old word and it doesn't get used in English very much because for many people, this will, today will be the first time you've heard the word reliquary, right? It means a place where relics are stored. So, the, uh, so these small pieces of ash and bone that came from the Buddha are venerated because it was thought that his blessing would remain with them. And so the idea of going to these places of pilgrimage is that these eight places, if we go to those places and we remember the Buddha, we'll receive the blessing of the Buddha and it will actually begin to help our mind toward awakening ourselves. And how is this possible? How is it, uh, I'll, I'll get you in a second. How is this possible? It's possible because we all have Buddha nature. Each one of us possesses the possibility of becoming an awakened being ourselves. I jokingly call this the good news of Buddhism. The good news of Buddhism is that we all have a mind. And even though for many of us, our minds are a source of stress and confusion, uh, that they're also the place where our Buddha nature resides. So we all have a mind that has the potential to awaken to its own Buddha nature. But we need methods to uncover our Buddha nature. And those methods consist of doing no harm, not harming ourselves, not harming others, practicing uh, virtue, which is um, taking care of ourselves and benefiting others, and taming the mind. And so these three things, doing no harm, practicing virtue, and taming the mind are basic practices in Buddhism. And so uh, the doing no harm part, that's a little hard, but we, cause you know, we're, we're all, uh, the Buddha said that uh, our suffering, a lot of our suffering comes from clinging. And of all the things we cling to, we cling to our self concept the most, you like, the, we're the ones who say my way or the highway and so on. And so as a result, we suffer a lot because of our clinging. And that is when we do things that are wrong. When we're clinging to self, clinging to situations, clinging to people, clinging to things, this is when we cause harm to ourselves and others, sometimes intentionally, sometimes inadvertently, but we cause harm. And if we become more mindful through the practice of meditation, we will do less harm to ourselves and we'll do less harm to others because our minds will be more aware of their own state. They'll be more aware of their own, of its own activity. And when our minds are more aware of its own activity, we can actually make changes. To me, that's the coolest part of Buddhism is that when we slow the mind down in meditation, we can actually pause 
and make better choices. My friends in the 12-step tradition, they often say that when they are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt, they have to stop. <laughs> they have to stop and take a break and ask themselves how they're <laughs> feeling. They ask themselves how it's going inside, and then they take action based on wise principles of how to, how to be and how to act. And so if we can practice that, meditation helps us do that. So that helps us to refrain from doing things that harm, but also it helps us to begin doing things that help. We can begin to be kinder to ourselves. We can begin, we can begin to be kinder to others. We can slowly train. We can say, I'm sorry when we hurt somebody. We can say, um, uh, you're looking beautiful today or whatever you want to say to someone to help them feel better when they're not feeling well. You can do things you can reach out to help other people and benefit them. And so that is the benefit of others. But there's another form of benefit. And that form of benefit is accumulating virtuous mind, accumulating a virtuous mind. And accumulating a virtuous mind is sometimes called accumulating merit. And I know a lot of people say, well, is merit like spiritual money or something? And you have to like accrue a lot of it. And the answer is not exactly, not exactly. That's, that's taking a little bit of a cynical view. Uh, but, um, but the way I like to look at merit is that just as we can cultivate negative states in our mind, you know, if, if we if we uh, get if we get hurt, then we might nurse feelings of anger. You know, it, you know what I'm saying. If we feel um, left out or slighted, we might nurse feelings of resentment. Uh, if we feel we didn't get something we deserve, we might feel resentment. I mean, you know. So there's a lot of things that we can work on in our minds to help us feel bad, but there are also things we can do that help us feel good. And one of those things that we can do is prayer. We can think of the Buddha, pray to the Buddha. We can think of the bodhisattvas, the beings who are in training to be Buddhas and honor them. We can create shrines. Remember I said I was a shrine geek. We can create shrines. We can make offerings on the shrines. And as one of my Lama friends once said, okay, Buddha statues on a shrine do not eat. And they do not drink and they do not really smell the beautiful flowers or drink or eat the beautiful offerings you make. So what's the point? The point is that, the, that we're making them for the Buddha that's within us, to nurture that Buddha that is within us and to create a mind of virtue and generosity and goodness. So that's why we make offerings. It's not that the statues enjoy them, it's that when we make these offerings, we're in, a, in, a, in like a tender place, a vulnerable place, a giving place, a generous place. And, and you know how it feels. I mean, you can just sit here right now and think about how it feels to give a treat to an animal, right? Or to give a little toy to a small child. You just know how that feels. That feels really good. But you also know how it feels to, to, uh, to um, say an angry word to someone or to or to experience an angry word yourself and you know you can you can you can feel the difference in your your being and the in the core of your being you can feel that difference and so we get to through the practice of meditation choose we get to choose virtue and we get to choose the capacity to um uh, what's the right word uh to to do virtue rather than to do harm and so going to shrines and making offerings, going to stupas or visiting places of pilgrimage, all of these are methods for accumulating virtue. So I'm gonna take a break here for a moment and see if there are any questions. I know that I'm gonna uh, take a quick look at chat and see if there's a question there. Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay, good. Um, Caitlin, I'm going to ask you to, um, to watch chat uh, during the next minute or two and see if any uh, questions come up and then you can ask when I, uh, I call for questions from the, the group. Does that sound good? Okay. So, uh, Julie, you had a question. And I have another one. Oh, good. Now you have two. Okay, go for it. Oh, um, you were talking about the eight sacred places of the Buddha. Yes. I wondered if you know 
Yes, and in fact, they're on one of the slides. Oh, uh, so yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, the questioner was asking where the uh, eight sacred places were, and uh, that's going to be the next part. We're going to start the slides. Uh -huh. Yes, you can ask one more. Yes, yes, you can. Bonus question. <laughs> So as far as merit goes, um, do you accumulate merit, you know, given the treat to an animal or, you know, helping to you know, hold the door for somebody or uh -huh. either of those things, or is it mainly, you know, going to tenure and practice or, you know, you, know, you accumulate, yeah, the, the person's asking uh, it when the merit is accumulated, is the merit accumulated with the action itself or with the intention? and so on. And is it only for uh, Dharma things or is it for mundane things too? And the answer is uh, you do accumulate a virtuous mind, whether it's a mundane activity like giving food to an animal, uh, which for the animal, it's not mundane. Uh, let me just say that. <laughs> it's very important to the animal. And so uh, whether you are giving uh, love and kindness to uh, a being who is uh, as, as the same as you or different from you, it's all the same. It's all virtue. The only pr problem is, is that you have to also have a virtuous intention. And so you have to have your mind and your action in uh, together. They have to be together. Here's an example. Gampopa in the 12th century, he wrote a book called the Jewel Ornament of liberation or the ornament of precious liberation in which he gave sort of a, a point for point um, teaching on how a person progresses from an ordinary being to a Buddha. And so, um, and so, whoops. Uh, so uh, what he, uh, what he had, he says is that you can do a virtuous thing with a bad attitude. Okay, he said, you can give a gift to someone, but you can give that gift in such a way that you look like you're insulting the person that you're giving the gift to. So he said, you can give a gift with a, you know, with a bad intention, like, here, take this, you know, uh, instead of being nice and saying, here, have this, you know, <laughs> you know, so you have to have your mind and your actions together. And the, it's great if they're both, if they're both beneficial and positive. And it's, it's the same with Dharma. You know, some people make offerings in front of their shrine and they say, oh, I'm big and important because I can make great offerings. It actually happens. People sometimes get that feeling. Sometimes they get it fleetingly and then they say, now, 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 don't do that. <laughs> we have to be our own best Dharma friends sometimes and see when we're getting off uh, when we're going off, sailing off from a positive intention into a negative intention. There's a famous story about a hermit who lived, a Dharma hermit who lived in a cave or something, and he found out one of his sponsors was coming to visit. So he tidied up his shrine so it would look clean for the patron, because after all, the patron was funding his retreat. And then he realized that he was doing it for a selfish reason. And so then he threw dirt on the shrine. <laughs> yeah, he threw dirt on the shrine because uh, he, as a lesson to himself, you know, he wasn't disrespecting the shrine. He, what he was doing was he was disrespecting his ego fixation and he was trying to um, correct his faulty attitude. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's not something I would encourage people to go around doing, uh, but, but, <laughs> because of the intensity of the hermit's feeling and uh, the, his wish to forcefully put down his ego, uh, sometimes things like that happen. But I mean, it's, a, it, it's kind of a funny story and it's kind of a silly story to us, but it does illustrate how we can, uh, how we can do something that looks good, but isn't. So did that satisfy your question? Yeah, so good things with good attitude are the best. You have a question. Yeah, I was curious if you were going to make the uh, um, uh, media available to us later. Yeah. Do some fill in. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, kind of, kind of. We'll make uh, the question was: uh, Should we? Am I going to make the media available? And the answer is yes. Yes. And then for my real question, kind of, kind of. Oh yeah, piggybacking here. on. Um, so if let's say I knew that I was going to feed my cat. Uh huh. Is it kind of a loophole if you go? Okay. All right. All right. Get myself together here. Okay. Now I'm going to, you know, 
feed her, give her food, do this virtuous act, stopping and aligning your mind and then doing the action, is that kind of a loophole to it? Or do you need well, to you know, I hadn't really thought about it that way. The questioner is, is saying, is talking about feeding the cat and uh, and then as one goes about one's life automatically sometimes, because I think that's what you're talking about mm -hmm. is sometimes we do things on autopilot. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning, I'm on autopilot until I'm at work. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I just kind of like do my day. And, uh, and yes, if you, um, I think it is, it is always beneficial to, to be, to give things to people, even if you do it sort of mindlessly and on autopilot, it's still beneficial. It's just that you increase the benefit when you bring your mind into alignment. And, um, and we have to be careful that we don't become like overly obsessed with things, you know, and like, because um, a friend of mine has a saying, he says, don't let the let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In other words, because we wanna do things perfectly and have perfect alignment all the time, we, we can, that can actually become unhealthy and it can turn into a form of arrogance. So we have to, I mean, this whole middle way thing in Buddhism, it's quite a chore. It's dedicating the merit. Dedicating the merit. I mean, it's it's quite a chore to be a Buddhist because you have to be mindful about stuff. So I mean, you know, because we we want to be the middle path. We not too much one way, not too much the other way. Always holding the mind in the middle. And what's interesting about this is that even though it's a little bit of a funny thing to do at first to try to say, you know, you're feeding the cat, and suddenly you say, well, wait a minute. May all sentient beings benefit from my feeding the cat. That's, there's, that's cute. That's cute. That's lovely. That's lovely. I think that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's very sweet. And, uh, but again, you have to be, and then dedicate your merit so that you're not keeping the merit from feeding the cat. I mean, this middle path, it really requires us to be mindful all the time which is, you might think that's a chore and maybe it is at first and maybe some days it's even more of a chore. But the fact of the matter is when we are present with people, when we're present with our actions, when we're present with each other, we live more fully. Because I mean, everybody has, has had coffee with a friend and seen their eyes go somewhere else. <laughs> I had a guy I used to work with at the newspaper. And whenever we'd go out to lunch, I would be chatting with him and I'd notice that his busy light was on. He was just kind of like somewhere else doing something else. And, and it was really weird, you know? And I, I often thought that I should mention it to him, but I decided not to. <laughs> but that's being present with people and things is really great. And it's part of what makes uh, being a Buddhist, uh, a bit of a joy because it's like we get to enjoy more of our life because we're more present with it. So I'm uh, so thank you for asking that question. Yes, another question. Um, so what happens on the shrine to the fresh baked goods or the flowers? Do they just deteriorate? Someone throws them out? Or is Got it. Done or yeah, uh, that's this is a great question. Uh, the questioner is asking, what do you do with uh, items that you offer on your shrine? after they begin to become less nice <laughs> as the flowers wilt or the, you know, whatever. There are two or three different ways of doing it. Some folks change out their uh, perishable offerings uh, on a daily basis because they can afford to or whatever. Um, so some people will take, their, take the food offering from their food offering and put it outside or actually put it on a separate plate and give it to the family because you wouldn't want to take the plate off your shrine and then use the shrine plate to serve your family. It's a little weird. Um, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, they are Buddhas inside, but you know, let's be, let's be real. So, but, uh, but so that's one, that's one tradition is every day you would take the food offering off your shrine and you would like take the little dead flowers off and things like that. And some people, um, it's better not to wait until things become rotten. Yeah. It's, I think that's a little bit disrespectful um, because it's like, um, it, you know, I asked Kempo Kartha Rupache about whether I needed to even make water offerings on a daily basis, you know, cause that's a traditional way for a Buddhist to tend the shrine. Not everybody has like gold and silver to offer. We just might have a, a, a single bowl of water 
and we might put water in that bowl every morning as an offering to the Buddha, because we can imagine a bowl of water to be anything. It, we could imagine it to be gold, silver, and jewels, and, and food, and everything else. And then at the end of the day, we take that off, and then we can put it in the cat's bowl or the dog's bowl, uh, or we, you know, right? Or we can put it on a plant. Or if you live in a high rise, you have to put it down the drain. I mean, you know, you just got to do what you got to do. So the so I asked Rinpoche, do we make these water offerings fresh every day? And he says, do you eat every day? <laughs> do you drink every day? Of course you make new ones every day. And, uh, and that was the way that Rinpoche often would teach, you know, he often taught like that, uh, you know, where he would, where he would just like say, look, come on now, <laughs> his version, his version of saying, come on now, you know, uh, he was so patient with us, I do have to say. So uh, does that answer the question about what to do with your offerings on a daily basis? Okay, very good, that's fantastic. Any other questions from here? Okay, uh, um, Caitlin, do you have any questions coming up from the uh, from the chat? We have a, a comment and a question. Okay, um, comment. Uh, Leona May says that she loves the phrase accumulating virtuous mind. She struggled with the idea of merit and these words uh, help her a lot. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And Kelvin says he's from Singapore and he has a friend that has a stupa that he says contains the Buddha's relic in it at his home altar. And he asks if this is possible. Oh, is that possible? Yes, there are, uh, there are several different types. We'll start with that one. And then I do want to say one more thing uh, to Le Leona May's question about merit. Um, so to the, the gentleman asking about, uh, is it possible for a person to have a relic of the Buddha in their little shrine stupa and the answer is it is it is theoretically possible and that's because there are several what we would call degrees of relics there are actual the actual relics themselves the actual pieces of bone or the uh, scraps of uh, of a robe or whatever so there's that type of of relic which are the pieces from the body or the some of the objects uh, touched by the the, the person and then there's like a, a second degree where it's objects that were touched to that relic, and then they become blessed themselves. And so uh, this is uh, a common method. Another one is called a relic pill, which is made uh, from uh, washing uh, a sacred object. And then the pill is made from the water that was, that was used to wash the sacred object. And so there, there are many types of, of relics. And so it is possible that your friend has one of these, uh, one, he, could, he or she could have any one of these three types of relics, the actual relic, something that had been touched to it, or a relic pill that was made from washing the sacred object. So there's lots of different ways that you can have relics. So thanks for that. And to Leona May's question, I'm glad you asked, I'm glad you made that comment, Leona May, because I forgot to cover something about merit that I wanted, uh, wanted to cover. And uh, this is, um, and the, it's about, it's about that virtuous mind. We were talking about maintaining and cultivating a virtuous mind. Let's face it, we are every minute of every day conditioning our minds with what we think, what we say, and what we do. I mean, we're human, right? We have, to, we have to condition our skin to keep it nice and moist, right? We have to condition our hair to, to, to have it do what it's supposed to do and be how it's supposed to be. We condition our skin and our hair, and we, we do all of these things to take care of our body. But we also condition our mind every minute of every day. And uh, we are making habits every minute of every day. My teacher, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, said that we are, all of us, just creating habits. And the, I, I was just talking with Helder about this the other day. I thank you for being here. Um, uh, there's a Sanskrit word called vasana, and it, and it means like a habit, a pattern. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the Tibetan word for vasana or habit is uh, bakchak, B-A-K, 
C-H-A-K, Bakchak. And so Rinpoche, when we were in three-year retreat, he was telling us how great it was that we had taken time off from life to be in three-year retreat. He said, you know, all you're doing every minute of your life is making bok chak for your future life. He said, you can't just think about now. He says, you got to be thinking about your future too. So when we are conditioning our minds with virtue, it really does condition our mind. It, it, it just makes us happy. And it makes us feel less tense and it makes us feel good when we're doing virtuous things and cultivating that virtuous mind changes our inner atmosphere. On another occasion, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche was asked by a person who said, oh, I've been doing meditation for years and years and years and I've never attained Buddhahood and I haven't really improved myself or any of that kind of stuff, what's wrong? <laughs> I've been practicing meditation for many years and I'm not really changed. What's wrong? And he said, you know, there's lots of reasons. Rinpoche answered his question. He said, there's lots of reasons. He said, number one, how much practice do we really do? Come on, let's be honest. Maybe we do 15 minutes a day, you know, 20 minutes a day. Uh, you know, so he said, time-wise, we're probably not doing as much as we think we're doing. <laughs> So you, so you can't say you've been practicing literally for years because that's not true. <laughs> you've only been practicing for hours at best. And so he said, that's one. But the other part of it, he says, is virtue. He says, the other part of it is virtue. He said, because when you condition your mind with virtuous thoughts, words, and actions, he said, you create the conditions, the atmosphere, he used the word uh, atmosphere, you create the atmosphere in your mind for wisdom to, to arise. So again, virtue makes us feel better, makes us feel happier, makes us feel more at ease, but it also allows our interior wisdom to come up and to arise and to be present for us. So virtue is not just like do-gooding, it's actually about conditioning ourselves so that we can uh, be uh, more wise. So uh, thank you for making that comment, Leona May, because um, that was a point I had wanted to make about conditioning the mind with virtue that I had forgotten to make, so thanks. Any other questions um, there, um, Caitlin? No, that's, that's it for now. Okay, great. Any other questions here? Okay, what time is it? I have to, I have to check my time, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give, when I do two hour programs, I give people a five minute break. And so we're going to do a five minute break right now. You can get up, move about the cabin. If somebody wants to make coffee, I'm, it's a hint. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't drink it. I don't drink it myself, but lots of other people do. And you can, you will make people very happy. So I'm going to pause just for a moment here. And uh, if you would pause the recording for just a moment, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, by the way, um, I'm just peeking in and seeing our friends. Uh, Kasha, are, are you there from Nova Scotia? Say hi. Uh, Hello. Hey. Hello, everyone. Hey, thank you so much for being here, uh, Kasia. Uh, I hope you're learning some things you enjoy. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm stupa obsessed. <laughs> oh, stupa obsessed. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for... Um, for this teaching and I am learning a lot. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. I, I never I met Kempo Carter a couple of times, but I never received a teaching from him. So oh. you quoting him, it's like a big blessing for me. Oh. And especially on the subject that I adore. Yeah. Oh fantastic. I don't know if you can see my stupa. Uh, yes, I do. In the I background. Can see that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, it's a homemade stupa. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's brilliant, and I love it. Ah, it's brilliant. I love it. Oh, I can't. I can't wait. We're gonna have some fun now because we're gonna do the. Uh, we're gonna do the slideshow now, and uh, but Cassia, I just wanted to say hi, and I also wanted to, you know, uh, to thank you for being with us today from such a distance. And I understand we also have someone joining us from Asia. So, uh, I think that's you. Is that is that you, Kelvin? So thank you for being here. Okay, probably should get back to work, shouldn't I? Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, now I'm gonna to try to do two things at once. I'm not sure it's possible, but I'm gonna try. 
to both run the run this uh, as a screen share on Zoom and show it on the screen here in the classroom at Columbus KTC. So here, let's see if it will actually advance. Yes, cha-ching. Okay, it, I'm going to see if I can make this disappear. Can I make this? Can I make this disappear? Can I minimize it? No, that is not how it's going to work. Okay, so I apologize for not being able to make that disappear. All right. A uh, hide video panel? Yeah, it would be done in more again. Do that. <laughs> oh, more? Mm -hmm. I don't know if hide video panel is that, but. Uh, hide floating meeting controls? Yeah. Ah, yeah. thank you. You brought me the right location. Okay, let's back up. Hey, thank you. I got tech help here. I tell you what, this is, what do they call it? What is it? Uh, tech, what is it? The, the cloud. I, I'm getting, uh, no, the hive mind. That's it. I've got, <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I have a confession. Uh, just as Cassia was saying earlier, I am stupa obsessed. I have no idea why, but here I am. And uh, somewhere around 2012 or 2013, I got it in my head. Well, actually, it was way before that. It was probably in the late in the late uh, first decade of the 2000s. I started telling people I wanted to lead a stupa pilgrimage to the stupas of the Southwest because in the southwestern United States, starting in 1965 or something like that, Buddhist Tibetan Buddhist teachers began to uh, put up stupas to create stupas. The, we think that one of the first stupas in the United States was created in Santa Fe, New Mexico in the 1960s by uh, Dujan Rinpoche, uh, the Nyingma master who passed away uh, fairly, uh, fairly young, fairly early in the period of Tibetan Buddhism in the United States. And, we, and so I knew it in my head, that, in my heart, that I wanted to do a pilgrimage to, uh, to do this. And, uh, and so then I got KTD Monastery to agree to sponsor the pilgrimage. And uh, so I led three of them, uh, two to the Southwest and one to Northeast United States. This is one of the most incredible stupas that we visited. Some of the stupas are merely uh, structures with, uh, that are filled with blessing items. But this particular stupa and another one like it in Santa Fe have chapels inside. You see my little pointer here? This is actually a little chapel inside and it's got a shrine room in, inside of it. And, uh, and you know, and these, this is the group, uh, it was a rainy day when we went to Wappinger's Falls, New York to visit uh, Palpung Tupton Choling, which is where this is. And this stupa overlooks the Hudson River. And uh, it is, it's, it's gorgeous on the outside, it's gorgeous on the inside, it has incredible presence and so on. We'll talk a little bit more about what makes stupas so special in a few minutes, but I just wanted to give this as an illustration of just how stupa obsessed a person can be. Uh, there were about 20 people on each of the three pilgrimages and they weren't all the same 20 people. And uh, we, uh, for the first one in the Northwest, I handed people a copy of the Tashi prayer and I said, We've got six weeks before we're going on this trip together. Every day, please recite the Tashi prayer as auspiciousness toward us this, this tour. And everything worked out beautifully. We had a great tour guide. We had a great bus. Uh, we, had a great, we had great hotels. And the food was fantastic the whole trip. We, we were like marveling, like, how is it this good? Because <laughs> you know, usually you'll get bad food sometime, but everybody was like incredibly kind and great. It was like literally like being on a cloud. Mm -hmm. We were like carried through the five days. It was five days in the Southwest, a lot of fun. We saw, I think seven stupas or eight, I forget. <clears throat> yeah, we were kind of nuts. And then we would get on the bus again after we finished seeing one stupa. We'd get back on the bus and we'd start reciting the Tashi prayer as the bus took off. And the driver's like, we were driving the same. <laughs> anyway, so this is this is one of those pilgrimages. Okay, here are the uh, eight types of stupas, and um, the this uh, this particular uh, and each one of them has to do with uh, uh, the. Um, uh, an episode in the life of the Buddha. Remember the eight places? 
This is uh, called the heaps of lotuses. And uh, there, and uh, on the steps, it is, it shows lo little lotus petals. Mm -hmm. And these heaps of lotuses uh, are, uh, are associated with the Buddha's birthplace. The Buddha's birthplace is associated with this. At first, people, and this is, well, when I finish the eight, I'll tell you a funny story about this and what this has to do with um, Christian pilgrimage. The, the second one of these uh, eight stupas is called the Great Awakening. And this commemorates the Buddha's enlightenment. This is the type of stupa that you will see most commonly is the enlightenment stupa. We had this, and this is the stupa that we have out front. Uh, it's called the Great Awakening stupa. The next stupa is called the stupa of many doors. And it commemorates the Buddha's first teaching. Uh, and each of these, uh, um, and there actually are like little, literally little doors, images of little doors. Up the uh, up these particular this particular set of steps. It's, uh, it's uh, because because it's like the many doors of teaching. He opened the many doors of Dharma for people. Then uh, the next one is the uh, is the uh, the Buddha's miracles, and uh, it has an extra set of steps in the front, and this commemorates uh, the Buddha's. Um, this commemorates the Buddha's debate with non-Buddhist scholars. Debate was like a spectator sport at the time of the Buddha. And in fact, the stakes were high because it was the custom in India at that time that if you had followers and someone else had followers and they challenged you to a debate, if you lost the debate, your followers would become the other person's followers. They would change their opinion and yeah, I know, change their view and opinion and, and so forth and so on. So the stakes were pretty high for the Buddha. And, uh, and these uh, six non-Buddhist teachers were after him basically. And, uh, and they wanted to debate him. And he said, not yet, not now. And so he kept walking, he just kept walking. And they went from town to town gathering spectators who were waiting for the spectacle of this debate. And uh, eventually when, uh, when he got to the spot where he thought it was the most auspicious, he said, okay, now I'm ready, let's do the debate. And, uh, and so he, uh, they debated with words. And then after that, he started performing miracles. And uh, I think he performed a different miracle a day for like 15 days. Anyway, so he won the debate, <laughs> needless to say. And this, uh, this stupa, the stupa of uh, miracles commemorates uh, his, uh, the, the, the place and the time when he uh, won this debate. The next one is the, uh, oh, I see. This is actually uh, not one of the eight stupas. This is a stupa that shows the various types of decorations that can be placed on stupas. For example, these uh, garlands, they're, uh, they, they're garlands, they can be placed on the stupa or seed syllables or statues can be put in, the, in this uh, section, which is called the gao, G-A-U in Tibetan or relic case. And, um, and so uh, there's pictures and then you can put like Dharma wheels on it and then, uh, and then images of Vajras and so on. So that's not, it's not a ninth kind of stupa. It's just a, an illustration of the types of decorations that can be added to the other stupas. So the next, uh, the next stupa is called the uh, descent from the God realm or the descent from heaven uh, stupa. And it commemorates an, uh, an, um, a moment in the Buddhist life when he went to the realm of the 33 gods, uh, which is um, a god realm where his, his natural mother had been reborn after she died. So she was, have, having given birth to the Buddha, she died seven days after the Buddha was born. 
and she was reborn in the realm of the gods. And he wanted to repay her kindness. And so he went to the realm of the 33 to teach Dharma there. And, uh, and he, uh, he decided that he would teach Abhidharma or cosmology to the gods because to, for auspiciousness reasons, the teaching had to be given in one sitting and only the gods could sit that long. So uh, that's the way the legend goes. But uh, the God said when he finished giving this teaching, uh, they said, uh, hey, uh, uh, will you stick around? And he said, no, I got stuff to do. Um, and so he, uh, he descended from the God's realm with Brahma on one side, Indra on the other side, walking him down three ladders. You know, he was on the center and they were in the, on the sides. Whether you believe stories like this or not, the idea is that the Buddha repaid his mother's kindness and then returned to help the, us human disciples. And so this is uh, by, the, by the three ladders that are uh, going up in the stairs here. I'm sorry, what is that one called again? Uh, the descent from the God realm or the descent from heaven. Uh, then, okay, I, uh, I think, Oh yeah, okay. This is the uh, this is the um, reconciliation stupa. Uh, my little note calls it the the healing of this of the schism, uh, but uh, that's a fancy word. Uh, so um, this is often called the reconciliation stupa, and it has extra. It has um, the the corners are um, are uh, carved out, going up the steps, and this. Um, and this has to do with uh, the attempt by the Buddha's cousin, Devadatta, to take over the Sangha. And, uh, and Devadatta was um, prideful and he thought he was smarter than the Buddha. And so he directly challenged the Buddha uh, and the, the Sangha was in danger of falling apart. And, uh, and then he, um, the, the Buddha, um, uh, essentially defeated Devadatta in uh, in debate, and uh, and then this uh, stupa re recalls the reconciliation of the sangha, and the Buddha's power to bring the the, the sangha back together. Yes. Was Devadatta the one? Uh, he also fell in love with the Buddha's wife, but then the Buddha's wife. Loved him. Oh, I see. So there might have been an interpersonal. Uh, you yeah. know, I honestly don't know all of the details of the story of Devadatta, but that definitely makes it. You know, if there's a love triangle, mm -hmm. well, then that makes it. That makes it like a Bollywood classic. You know. <laughs> so I'd I'd say that sounds right, but we'd have to. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, and there are so many stories about the life of the Buddha, you know, as you can see from these eight different stories, there are many, many stories about the life of the Buddha, but all of them have the same heart to them, which is that a awakened mind is wise, is endlessly wise and endlessly capable. That's really, in the end, that's the, to me, the meaning of, of all of these uh, stories. We don't, and by the way, we don't have to believe these stories. I remember um, uh, when I first started studying Buddhism, uh, my teacher, Kempo Karta Rinpoche, uh, he didn't realize he was quoting 12-step literature, but he actually said in one of his first talks and the translator translated it exactly in these words, if you don't believe what you hear, don't worry, it's okay. He said, take what you need and leave the rest. And uh, he didn't have any idea that he was quoting 12-step literature, but he was. And I think it's just really amazing that the recovery tradition and the Buddhist tradition have so much in common. Uh, they're all about helping people. So anyway, so we again, we don't have to believe all of these stories, but they're taught to us as a way of talking about the extraordinary qualities of, of awakening. How would it be to be all wise? How would it be to be all compassionate? That's, you know, that's our own story that we're going to find out. The, um, this uh, stupa, uh, which uh, has um, 
I'm trying to see the special characteristic of this stupa, and I'm not seeing it in the drawing, but it looks like there might be some extra pieces on the steps. This is called, um, oh yeah, there it is. Oh, I see the top, the top layers of the are round and the lower layers of the of the steps are square. That's the difference. Uh, this is called the life extending uh, stupa. And I have seen very few of these, um, except in collections of all eight, because sometimes people will build, purposely build all eight stupas at once. They did this at our home monastery in Woodstock. They built all eight. Um, but this one is called life extending. It has to do with one of the Buddha's disciples uh, requesting him to live longer when it appeared that he was going to die. Uh, and so they asked him to remain. And so this is the, the comm this commemorates the Buddha's uh, being asked to remain. And then finally, this one, uh, the para nirvana or the, the, the stupa commemorating the Buddha's passing away. Um, it, it's the one that is more traditionally dome shaped than the others, and this is the um, and this symbolizes the place where the Buddha passed away into nirvana, which is why uh, the final nirvana, which is why it's called para or final nirvana or his uh, his death. Interestingly enough, uh, these eight types of stupas. Uh, came about because of the Buddha's instruction that people go to the places. If, they, if you want to remember me, go to these places. Well, as you know, the world is not always a safe place. And so it was not always possible for people to do physical pilgrimages to these eight places. But so I think, this is just my personal opinion, I think that the eight types of stupas were really, they have a great function, which is to help people who can't do pilgrimage. They can't go to Lumbini Garden where the Buddha was born. They can't go to Varanasi where he, you know, Bodh Gaya where he reached enlightenment. They can't go to Varanasi where he taught and so forth and so on. They can't go to these places, but they can visit these stupas and recall the Buddha just as he had intended for us to do. So um, any questions about these eight types? Yes, I'll start with uh, Chuja. Do you know what determines which type of stupa will be built at a specific location? I, I don't know what de determines uh, which, uh, uh, I, I don't know what the determining factor is in the decision to do a specific style of stupa, but we can ask the lamas, that, the Tibetan lamas that question and see if we can get an answer for that one, because that is interesting. Uh, what I do know, is that uh, many places who have the funds will actually have all eight stupas somewhere on their grounds. And uh, because it's, it's auspicious to have all eight, KTD Monastery has all eight. And those of you who have seen pictures of the extraordinary stupa garden in Toronto that Lama Tashi uh, put together. There's 108 stupas there. 108, and they're in concentric rows. Where is that? It's uh, in Aurora, Canada, Aurora, Ontario, which is north of Toronto. Yeah, I, and uh, and they just finished them like last year or the year before. And uh, I, you know, can you say stupa pilgrimage bus tour? Yeah. All right, sign me up. You have a question, Joanne? Um, yes. You mentioned that one of them uh, represented as far as miracles that the Buddha did. Yeah. Do you have any um, stories as far as? I don't. I would I, as to what the miracles were. You know, um, I I do believe uh, one of them was uh, the causing of the appearance of two suns in the sky. Uh, another one was uh, uh, fountains of water appearing in space and that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, so I, but yeah, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to look that episode up and get some details for you. Um, I but I appreciate you asking about it. And I'll do the same. Okay, great. Yeah, because I'm curious too. Yeah, I thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, Don first and then Helder. 
Which of the eight kinds is our? Uh, our stupa is the awakening, the great awakening stupa, this one. Uh, so it's the, it is the most common, because uh, to, to, to Juju's question, it is the most common one that people select. Because, I mean, it's inspiring. The idea that we all can achieve awakening, it's really inspiring. So, uh, Helder, that, that was your question. Okay, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Kind of. And it appears, except for the final one, that the only thing that's different is like the stairs. Is that correct? Yes. It, it, are... does appear, it does appear that everything is the same except the stairway with the exception of the Para Nirvana stupa, which actually has a dome shape. But they all do appear the same. Yeah, the, there are like there's this little ring here is like a, a, a ring of lotus flowers, but then the rest of the, the this one is all lotuses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, with this diagram um, slide, mm -hmm. is that going to be something that uh, can be? Um, Reprinted. I'm, you know, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, the questioner is asking if this diagram of the eight stupas can be made available to people. And I think, uh, I think we should do that. What I'll do is I'll uh, put a put together a folder on Dropbox, and then anybody who has, um, this is to your question too earlier, Matthew. Um, I'll create, I'll create a folder on Dropbox, and I will. Um, put all of these in that folder and share it with everybody so they can have a copy of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, I, I, I really appreciate you thinking about that. Um, yes. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned that the first stupa, the heaps of lotuses, uh -huh. uh, something about that Christian pilgrimage. Oh know? yeah. I apologize for bringing it up in the context of the first stupa we looked at. It doesn't really have to do with the first stupa. That was my bad. Here's the thing, here's the thing. In, uh, in the old days, it was thought uh, in Christian circles that it was very special to go to the, uh, the Holy Land where, the, uh, where Jesus was born and where he lived, taught, and where he died. So, uh, but in, uh, during uh, certain periods of time, Europe and the Middle East were not safe for travel. And so they created a design uh, called the labyrinth uh, and, and this was a form of, uh, it looks almost like a maze, but it's, it's not a, a confounding maze. It's just a, a, a slow walk that would mimic the aspects of Christian pilgrimage. Uh, and, uh, and so in a way, just like the labyrinth is a, is a, uh, a symbolic pilgrimage for Christians, just in one little spot. These stupas are a symbolic, a, a, a symbolic pilgrimage for Buddhists, and that you can visit these eight types of stupas and have the sense that you were present at the eight places. It's just, it's like a symbolic uh, pilgrimage, just like the labyrinth is. Other questions here? Okay, um, um, let's see. Caitlin, do we have any questions on uh, chat? Yes. Leona May asks if there's a listing of names and locations of U.S. stupas available, and particularly any in the Northeast. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, there. Uh, what I will do is during the lunch break. Oh yeah, I won't have I won't have time to do it now. So uh, and and we're not going to have Zoom for the afternoon session because we're going to be outside. So. Um, I will, I will, if, if you do me a favor and shoot me a quick email to remind me, Leona May, just shoot me a quick email and then I will give you a link to the, there's a website, the Stupas of North America. It's kind of, it's kind of like funky. It's a kind of funky little website. That's uh, just kind of like, it's like a fan site, you know, somebody who collected and it. And it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a lot. Plus, there's a beautiful picture book that's been created, also called The Stupas of North America. And I have that. And I have it in electronic book form. And it's just really great to look at. And, uh, and, so, um, and so I, uh, the, the only thing I know about is the, I know about the locations of the stupas uh, in Northeastern New York. And uh, now there's at least, uh, there's maybe three, four or five more added to the Northeast New York uh, list because they built the ones at KTD, they built the ones at Carmel Ling. And so we've got more stupas to visit. 
but yeah, you can you can uh, go to these places. And uh, what I'm going to do, uh, hopefully, in uh, in the last portion here, is to go over a practice that you can do when you're at the stupas. Because uh, when we did these tours, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche, I said to Rinpoche, well, guess what? We're actually going to do a stupa pilgrimage. What do we do when we get there? <laughs> How do we interact with the stupas? I'm excited we're going, but what do we do when we get there? And, uh, and I'll go over that list of things he told us to do. And um, I have a copy of it that I can give to everybody who's here. And then again, if you remind me, Leona May, uh, the, the practice to be done at stupas, I will, send, I will include it in the file that I send to everybody else. Uh, other questions on the, uh, on the chat? No, that's that's it for now. Uh, Julie, you had a question. I do have a silly question. Maybe so. Um, so each of the, the stupas between, you know, the U.S., Bodhagaya, everywhere, have relics of the Buddha himself? Or? That's a really good question. Do they all have relics of, do all stupas around the world have relics of Buddha Shakyamuni? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, even if um, Even if they wouldn't have, relics of the Buddha Shakyamuni of one of those three types, you know, the actual relic, the thing, the item that had been touched to the relic or the relic washing pill. They, if, if, if they don't have one of those, they will undoubtedly have the relics from other awakened masters. Uh, and, and there are, uh, and some, uh, some stupas that we, that I have seen, I don't know if it's any of the ones I have visited, but I have seen some stupas written about online where they actually have this exhaustive list of all the relics mm -hmm. that are inside. And I should, uh, I, and then uh, I'll go ahead and advance uh, to the next slide and I'll show you, um, this, is, um, this is the stupa that we have. Oh, Johanna, yes. How many enlightened Buddhas are there? Uh, the, the questioner is asking how many enlightened Buddhas are there? <laughs> It, it is actually um, theoretically, uh, theoretically speaking, because everyone, every being has Buddha nature. There are countless Buddhas that have been, because if you think about it, everyone who has a mind that, and is sentient has the potential for Buddhahood. Now, we all know that dust mites in the carpet may or may not have the, the ability uh, to practice meditation. You see what I'm saying? So theoretically, there are lots of possibilities for Buddhas, but since human beings have been around for a very long time, it's, it, it's countless that beings, that some of those beings will have attained enlightenment. And so since enlightenment is a natural state that human beings experience, but because of our confusion, we don't rest in that state of Buddhahood and we don't realize our Buddha nature and become Buddhas ourselves. Um, some of us are uh, in the training stages. We're, we're bodhisattvas and Buddhas in training. But how that, many are recognized? Oh, lots. Okay. I, have, I have no number for you, but... Here's what, the, here's what one of the enlightened beings said, uh, was the Buddha himself said that we live in the age of 1,000 Buddhas. Okay. So it's not that 1,000 Buddhas are happening right now, right this minute, but there are going to be a lot of Buddhas. And so each, there's, um, there's um, let's go with the historical Buddhas. The Buddha Shakyamuni, depending on which of the sutras you read, was either the fourth or the fifth Buddha of this era of 1,000 Buddhas. And so there will be 1,000 individuals during this era who will live the demonstration life that the Buddha Shakyamuni lived. They'll be born in a royal state or in a luxurious state. They will give up their luxury. They will practice asceticism. They will meditate deeply and achieve Buddhahood and they'll teach and they'll pass away. So uh, that there's 1,000 individuals who will do that. Okay, it kind of reminds me what you stated, the thousand arm Chinrezi. Yeah, the thousand arm Chinrezi, that's right. Uh, and he's considered to uh, be like, a, extra capable of, of living out compassion. So thank you, yeah, thank you for that. But let me show you a couple more slides because uh, lunch will be in a, about 20 minutes. And so let's just see we can, what we can 
uh, do here. I, I just wanted to include this picture because it just makes me happy. Mm -hmm. um, this is the picture of uh, our stupa at Columbus KTC as it looked during the consecration in November of 2021. This is the stone stupa. I, I believe it's a manufactured stone. It could be granite, but I think it's more likely to be manufactured stone. We're gonna have a stone mason look at it and then tell us how to take care of it and get some advice from Lama Tashi about how to take care of it. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, we, we, whoops, uh, we put up, a, uh, we put up a, a tent around it because the weather was not going to be fair during the, uh, during the, the consecration. And, uh, and, the, and then we placed these uh, four tables around uh, all sides of the stupa and the, the tables were dressed up and, uh, and offerings, the uh, seven or eight types of offerings were set up on all four sides. Uh, and then the interior row also, there were like two rows of offerings, one row on the table, and then another one on the base of the stupa, which is what we're going to do this afternoon. I think we're going to, we might have one table. I think we, do we have a table for the front? Yeah, we have, we're going to do the four tables. You're awesome. Okay. So that means we're going to have some fun. Uh, and so um, when we do our practice, uh, we're going to add these tables, but um, this is how a person can uh, approach the stupa. <clears throat> Kempo Kartha Rinpoche said, you start by walking, uh, you know, walking up to the stupa and offering three prostrations or bows, depending on how much room there is. Some people can't bow getting down on the floor. I can't, for example, but there's also sometimes no room. And uh, after that, uh, you recite a, a refuge in bodhicitta prayer, uh, and arrange all of your offerings. You could, uh, I think, arrange the offerings first and then uh, do a refuge prayer. And then after the, uh, after the uh, offerings are arranged, then you can uh, recite any prayers that you like. Uh, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche recommended that we recite uh, one of the five aspiration prayers that are common in the Karmakaji tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, I happen to have um, a book of that. I don't see mine. So is mine? anyway, um, we have a book of these, of these prayers and we'll recite one of them today. And, um, and then after that, uh, one can uh, stand in front of the, of the stupa or along the sides and make a, a, a silent aspiration. Anything that you want to accomplish. It is said that when you make an aspiration in front of a stupa, it is as though you made it in front of the Buddha personally because of the relics inside. The, the relics of the Buddha stand in for the Buddha's presence. Mm. And, so, uh, and so by making your silent aspiration, like maybe you want to give up a bad habit, or maybe you want to accomplish something good, uh, or you want something uh, dharmic in your life or whatever, or you just plain old want to be a better person, uh, then you can make that aspiration in front of the stupa. And in that way, you make it as though it was in the front of the Buddha personally. And then after that, dedicate your merit, and then you can take the offerings and dispose of your offerings and dry out the, the, the water bowls and so on. And, uh, and, and in that way, you could do a practice with the stupa as your, uh, as your object of veneration and so on. Each of the parts of the, of the stupa have meaning. And I have a, a slide about that. Oh yeah, this is a general article about what a, a stupa is and what are its blessings. Because I, uh, we're short on time this morning, I won't be able to go into it. Uh, but uh, I will. Um, it's a it's a lovely it's a lovely little web page. When we were raising money for Kempo Kartha Rinpoche Stupa, some quotations about the blessings of a stupa and what it provides. And I'll make a copy of this slide presentation available to everyone, so you can watch it and also um, uh, visit these websites. And then there's also a symbolism of the stupa article that you could look at. 
And, um, and then, uh, but here's um, a picture that I just think is fantastic. It, it takes the geometric uh, elements of the stupa and it translates them into meaning. The, uh, the base uh, of the stupa, it says um, it, it, it is associated with uh, the, 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 uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the parts of the stupa relate to what are called the five elements. And the five elements are what our bodies are composed of, for example, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the wind element, and the element of space. And so just as our bodies are composed of five elements, the stupa symbolizes the five elements and uh, the wisdoms that are associated with them. The earth element is the lower, uh, the throne and the lower steps. And uh, that symbolizes the, um, uh, the wisdom of equanimity associated with one of the five Buddha families. The five elements can also be associated with the five Buddha families, which represent the overcoming of five types of mental affliction and the ripening of, of five types of native wisdom that we possess within us, which experienced improperly become our mental afflictions. Uh, and so that's the, the, the lower portion. The, the bumpa or the, um, or the vase uh, portion. So the, this is the steps, is the earth element. The, the vase or bumpa, B-U-M-P-A, B as in boy, U, M as in Mary, P as in Paul, A. The bumpa or the vase is um, uh, symbolic of the water element, which is the mirror-like wisdom that we possess. And there'll have to be a completely separate class on the five Buddha families at some point in the future to give, give the overview of the meaning of these wisdoms. But for today, it's just a list. So you can see they are all represented. I spelled Harmaka right. It looks so good, good going here. The next one is the, the spire. Is, uh, the spire is associated with the fire element which is the discriminating awareness wisdom. And by the way, each of these has to do with overcoming one type of mental affliction. Uh, the earth element is the overcoming of pride. The water element is the overcoming of anger. The, the red is the overcoming of uh, attachment. The fire element is, is uh, the discriminating awareness wisdom. The green uh, element uh, is the wind element, which uh, symbolizes all accomplishing wisdom, which is the purification of uh, jealousy and competition. And then the space element is the wisdom of all encompassing space or the Buddha wisdom. And it is, whoops, and it is uh, associated with the color white as well as uh, the overcoming of uh, ignorance. Uh, so um, that's a little bit about the five elements. On this side of the key, the jewel at the very top uh, is symbolic. This round, uh, this uh, sort of ovoid shape is uh, symbolic of a jewel and it symbolizes enlightenment. The sun that is beneath it is the, the wisdom, the feminine principle. The moon is the compassion uh, element, which is the masculine principle. Sometimes these are switched. One, one, is the other, one is the male and the other is female. I've seen them given both ways. The sun is one and the moon is the other. I've, I've heard them both, done both ways. But they're here, the father element and the mother element. And then the parasol, which is this portion here, is, the, is symbolic of compassion. The 13 disks that form the spire are the 13 powers of a Buddha, the 13 levels of accomplishment of the bodhisattvas up to enlightenment itself. The harmaka is, um, is symbolic of the eightfold noble path of right view, realization, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and meditation. 
the, um, the bumpa is symbolic of the seven elements of enlightenment, mindfulness, awareness, diligence, joy, mental flexibility, meditation, and equanimity. The four steps here are symbolic of the four immeasurables, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And then the lower three steps are the three jewels of refuge. The Buddha is the teacher, the Dharma is the teaching, and the Sangha is the community. So uh, this uh, will also be made available to you uh, as a reference piece. So when you receive uh, the copy of this, you, can, you will have a copy of this drawing as well. Pretty amazing, you know? And, and so what I tell people is that when you see this, it's shorthand for the presence of the Buddha's body, speech, and mind. Because inside, inside the stupa, the stupa is hollow. And inside the stupa, there is something called the life tree, which, is, which goes from here to here so that like the Buddha's body, because this suggests a Buddha sitting in meditation on a throne. There's the legs, there's the torso, there's the head and so on. Um, it suggests a Buddha sitting in meditation, although it's not actually a Buddha sitting in meditation, but like a Buddha sitting in meditation, there's a central channel of energy that runs uh, the, uh, through the center of the of the body of this Buddha. And uh, this, um, the life tree is uh, this central uh, piece of wood actually that's usually carved from a single tree. And, uh, and it is uh, painted uh, with different colors and shapes. And, uh, and then the packet of relics is attached to the heart of, this, of, the, uh, of the life tree, which is in the center. And, uh, and then all around in the throne, uh, if those of you who saw the stupa being created here, uh, the, the very bottom of it uh, was placed a, a weapon, a knife. And that's symbolic of the, the Buddha's wisdom overcoming violence. And then on top of that, offerings were placed, including musical instruments, uh, jars of legumes and, uh, and grains, uh, gemstones, and so on. And then uh, mantras were placed, rolls of mantras in small mini stupas called satsas, which are tiny stupas, were placed inside. Inside the, uh, the vase, uh, those of you uh, who got to put things, there's a mandala in the center. And then around it are all kinds of tiny offerings. Lama Tashi Dunda uh, created little um, clay made out of like plastic clay, a femo, you know, he, he made little offerings. And yeah, and I, I know Don, you took pictures of that. Uh, and so there's like a complete Buddha mandala of an enlightened uh, being in the center of this. And then offerings are placed around and so forth. There are several layers of those. And then there's also mantras uh, in, the, in any other uh, hollow area. And it's also filled with sandalwood powder and uh, juniper and you name it. There's a lot of stuff that goes into one of these. So that's a little bit about the symbolism. And I think that might have been the end of the presentation. Yeah, that's it. That's the end. Anybody have questions about this? Yes. The um, piece of wood you said, life tree. Yeah, the life tree. The life tree that's, that's running through the center is—is is that a, uh, a correlation to in some of our practices how we visualize the single channel? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, it is. Uh, the the questioner is asking if this has to do with the central channel spoken of in uh, uh, when in descriptions of the subtle or energetic body. That yes, it's yeah. It it, it uh, there's a wonderful film called Eye of the Land, E-Y-E, -E, Eye of the Land, that, um, that we showed during one of our fundraisers for Columbus KTC that was about the creation of the Crestone Colorado Stupa. And you got to see all those little pieces, you know, how they made the, how they made the life tree, how they put things together and so on. And it, it's in the film. And they had to make like a thousand satsas. It was a lot. 
So other questions? Yes. So scholarship, right? You have the on the solid Buddha on the Right. Um, I can't remember whether the Buddha on the outside of ours is the Buddha Amitabha or if it's the Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, if his if his uh, hand is touching his right hand is touching the earth, then it's Shakyamuni. If his hands are in uh, in cupped in his lap with a begging bowl, then it's uh, Amitabha. And uh, it was um, it was Lama Tashi who provided that image of the Buddha for us, and so I'm very grateful. And I don't know why he would have chosen one over the other. I'm thinking it was Shakyamuni. So, uh, but we we'll have to go and look. Other questions? Well, then we might have, are there questions uh, in the chat? Okay, might have covered it, but uh, Leona May asks if a tsa is like a mini personal stupa. Yes, it's it's a mini, it's a mini stupa. Some of the satsas are marked on the outside with the eight types of stupa in like little graphic shorthand. Is, they have is all this? Eight, yeah, some, some of the little stupas are, the, the little satsas will have images of the eight stupas all around the conical part. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so it's, yeah, they're like little mini stupas. And do we, if I have one of those, I, I should put it on my shrine? Oh, yes, absolutely. If you've got one of those, definitely put it on your shrine because you can make offerings in front of it because usually inside those little mini stupas, there will be either a grain of rice that was blessed by a, a great master or there might be a relic uh, or a relic pill from a great master, or there may actually also be a small roll of mantras in them. It's, it's really hard to know what's placed in each one. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yes. So you can actually circumambulate our home stupas. You can actually circumambulate your home stupas. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, circumambulation is, um, is a form of... Uh, of prayer in which you begin at the front of the stupa and then you walk in a clockwise direction around the stupa, keeping your right shoulder toward the stupa. Circumambulation is something that has been done in different faith traditions for a long time, but uh, the, uh, uh, the creation of stupas made it into um, a form of pilgrimage, you know, of, of making prayer and honoring the stupa by walking with it over your right shoulder. So yeah, and, and uh, people have asked if they can circumambulate the stupa here and people do, they come up and they circumambulate the stupa on their way up the stairs or down the, or up the ramp or down the ramp. And you can circumambulate the building, although I tell everyone, please don't use the, the, the don't, don't circumambulate just the building. You have to do the whole block. We have a neighbor whose house is literally this close to our building, and I don't want people scaring her by trying to circumambulate the building. So let that be a, war, a word to the wise, please don't do that. You know, if you're gonna circumambulate our shrine, uh, do, it from the, uh, do it from the perspective of the whole block. Start at the corner of Rich and Grub, and then go all the way down to Sullivan Avenue, up the alley and back around. It, it adds, you just consider it as that you're adding to your exercise every day. Uh, any other questions on chat, Caitlin? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, no, I appreciate this. Let's see if, uh, let's see, I think, let's see if I can, if we can make this thing happen. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, I have to, I have to find out now how to uh, go back to where we were, how to um, exit and get back the, um, I don't know how to get back, but now that I, now that I, oh, escape, that's right. Thank you, that, that brought it back, thank you. Oh, that's so good. So I'm gonna stop the, the screen share. Hey, hi there, okay, I'm, I'm looking at myself. <laughs> so um, I think, in fact, I think I'm gonna leave you there um, for a moment and, uh, and thank all of you for uh, being with us today. Uh, at this um, at this first ever class about the uh, the KTC stupa, uh, I've tried to give you a little bit of history about the stupa about how we came. And by the way, um, it was um, 
it was one of those things where, because I'm a, a, a geek, uh, a stupid geek, I wanted one. And we, we went through quite a bit to get this one. Uh, and, uh, and I'm so happy we have it. And uh, I'm really hopeful that all of you will uh, be able to, uh, to come and visit us at some point in the future. And I just wanna thank all of you for being here today. Uh, thank you, uh, Caitlin, for being our host with the most. And to uh, uh, Kasia and K uh, Kelvin from, uh, and Leona May uh, for being here at, at a distance. Hey, Kathy, you're down the street. It's wonderful to see you, Lamo. I, 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 are you still at work? Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I won't tell if you won't. <laughs> uh, so thanks uh, you know, to everyone for being here. Those of you who are here in person, we have uh, we have uh, read books that we're going to do a dedication. Yeah, if we can be of, of service to you guys uh, who are at a long distance and you want to write, uh, just you can write to uh, contact the organizer on. You can just press contact the organizer on Eventbrite. I feel so happy that we have people from. Uh, from uh, the uh, the northern part of North America and so forth and so on, and also from Asia on our call today. So thanks very much for helping us give the world a hug today, which I think it needs it at the moment. Um, I'm thinking in terms of uh, dedication prayers in the red books. Uh, I feel like, uh, where are we at? Dedication of Merit is on page 30. We'll recite this in English and uh, we'll make the aspiration that by uh, dedicating this merit uh, that uh, all beings everywhere are free from hunger, famine and warfare and that uh, disputation and, uh, and war everywhere uh, cease as fast as possible and that beings uh, be allowed to live in, uh, in, in health and in peace. We'll recite the, the prayers on 30, 31, and 32 in English. Through this virtue, may all beings gather the accumulation of merit and awareness, and may they attain the two supreme kayas arising from merit and awareness. May precious bodhicitta arise within those where it has not arisen, where it has arisen, may it not decline, but ever grow and flourish. By this merit, may all attain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may we free all beings. The courageous Manjushri, who knows everything as it is, Samantabhadra, who also knows in the same way, and all the bodhisattvas that I may follow in their path, I completely dedicate all this virtue. Through the blessing of the Buddha's attainment of the three bodies, through the blessing of the unchanging truth of Dharmata, and through the blessing of the unwavering aspiration of the Sangha, May this dedication prayer be accomplished. May the glorious lamas live long. May happiness and well being arise for all sentient beings present throughout space. May I and all beings, without exception, having gathered the two accumulations and purified the two obscurations, be swiftly established in the state of Buddhahood. Hey, Caitlin, I like it that you had the, uh, the stupa uh, practice there. Would you mind putting the stupa practice back up for us? And uh, I wanna uh, hand uh, copies of this out to folks here so that they can, thank you so much. They can take a look at it uh, just uh, briefly because um, I did forget to hand these out. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and you can kind of take a look at them. Um, uh, the, uh, it starts with uh, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sanghaya, when you perform your three prostrations. And then uh, you can, uh, 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 this is something I, so here what he had us do first was put the offerings out first. So 
I got it in the wrong order when I was talking about it. You put the offerings first and then do your three prostrations and then offer a mandala in either the long or short form. The mandala is basically offering oneself, yeah, one's own body, speech, and mind to the to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It's a yeah. And um, and then uh, after that, one recites the, uh, if it says, it says uh, next, if you brought any offerings. Oh, okay, well, there, there's the offerings. The offerings are there. I'm having a day with the offerings. As you can see, I can't decide. Are they at the beginning? Are they at the middle? Are they at the end? So it does appear, Rinpoche said to put them after this beginning. Then um, the four immeasurables, may all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never be separated from the highest bliss, which is devoid of suffering. May they come to the great impartiality, which is free of attachment and aversion. And then, uh, he, uh, then he has the, um, us recite the circumambulation mantra, which is a tongue twister. And uh, it goes like this, Nama, Naba, Naba, T, Nam, Tata, Gata, Ga, Nam, D, Palu, Ka, Nam, Koti, Ni, Yuta, Shata, Saha, Sa, Nam, Om, Bobo ri sari ni sari mo ri go ri sala bari soha. And I don't know how to say it beyond that. So it's a tongue twister at the moment. We're going to have one of the Tibetans help us learn how to recite it properly. But at least we've got the words here. And what you can do, this is taken from the sutra about stupas. There is actually a sutra about stupas. And so that's where this mantra is taken from. And uh, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche told me about this mantra, dictated it to me, and said that we should recite this as we circumambulate. But we didn't get him making a recording. We didn't get him to make a recording of the chanting. So we'll get somebody to do that for us so we can learn it properly. But for now, even if you don't know the mantra of going around stupas, you can say, Om Mani Peme Hom, the compassion mantra of Chen Rezi, and that will be perfectly fine, or any mantra that you know. And then after that, uh, it's, he says, you can do any other prayers and practice you wish. We will recite our, um, our, one of our munlams or our aspiration prayers here. And then there's dedications, just as we described. So uh, this, uh, this is, gives you, thank you for sharing that, Caitlin. Uh, uh, that gives you an idea of what the stupa uh, pilgrimage practice consists of. I spoke to uh, Lama Karma and, uh, and Lama Karma said that he has the, he's developed the custom of reciting the uh, stupa sutra uh, when he does visits to stupas. And so I said, well, make a prayer book out of it and we'll take it along. And so that's a little bit about all of us here. So I have to say goodbye now because if we don't get lunch, we, we won't get any farther here. What we will be doing at one o'clock is uh, I will be coming on Facebook Live uh, at one o'clock to just say hello. And, uh, and, uh, and, and if we're running late, I'll tell you to come back in five minutes or 10 minutes. And then once we uh, come back with Facebook Live, then we'll do uh, then uh, we'll do the little prayers together. And uh, and I'm gonna I don't know if I've got the stupa practice on the Eventbrite page. Um, hey, um, uh, Caitlin, uh, did you give folks the uh, link to that? Could you give folks the link to that prayer uh, in the chat, and then folks can copy that. There you go. So if you can copy that out of chat, that will give you um, the link to the little, this little one, you know, two page prayer. I feel that since it comes from Kempo Kartha Rinpoche, it's got a lot of blessing. So that I'm going to stick with this one for now. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. D dedicate your merit. Be well, and uh, we will see you uh, later this afternoon. Or if you want to come to one of our other programs, uh, you can check us out on Yay on on Facebook and on all of the uh, 
various social media channels. So be well. Omani Pei Mei Hong. Go benefit beings now. Okay. Thank you, Thanks Caitlin. So host with the most. See you this afternoon. Okay. See you later. <laughs>